Hey folks, welcome to a new episode of Breakdown, The Poet and the Poems, a show where a poet helps us to break down poetry as inspiration and motivation for our everyday lives. I am your host, Tamara J. Madison, and I am delighted to bring to you poet Ramika L. Bingham Risher, and she will be discussing her book, What We Ask of flesh. And trust me, like me, you will have no clue where this conversation is going to lead, but it will be delightful. So you know how we do. Go ahead on and grab your coffee, tea, snack, whatever you need, and check out what's happening on the latest episode of Breakdown. All right. Welcome, 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 everybody, to the newest episode of Breakdown, The Poet and the Poems. And I am very excited to share with you poet Ramika L. Bingham Risher. And we are talking about her book, What We Ask of Flesh. Now, before we even get started, I just have to just come on out and share that this book was nothing about what I thought it was going to be, right? I knew that it was one of her older books, and the title just grabbed me. Of course, you know, the title grabbed me, right? And I was like, let's do this one. I don't want to do her new one. I want to do this one, right? Something, and okay, this could be... Um, it might be like a sensual, sexy thing, or it might be something about the rights of women's bodies, which is a very timely discussion right about now, right? right. It totally knocked me off my feet, mm. okay? So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you're incredibly busy and there's a whole lot of things you could be doing, but you're here. I've been wanting to get you for a minute. I had to take a little hiatus, so I'm back. So usually the way that we start is I want to read an official description of the book. Sure. And then I share my own blurb for the book. I try to, as a writing exercise, I try to write a blurb for each book. So the official description that I took, actually, I want to use it. It is from the introduction of the book written by Patricia Smith. Yeah. And so these are the lines that I wanted to share as the description. A fervent song of praise is threaded through these stanzas. The mistress Bingham praises with her head thrown back, wailing to the rafters, then whispering in the back row of the choir. These poems move purposely toward a light that shines for anyone who reads them. Mm. Yeah. And what a gift she um, is. Yes. And I think that's in the fourth or fifth paragraph. And I thought, oh my God, that is the perfect <laughs> description, right? So then after reading the book a second time and reading those other things that I needed to support my understanding of the book, I was like, okay, what do I need to say about my this book? So this is what I came up with. You ready? Yes. Ramika L. Bingham Risha ain't scared. A. Hey. She is not the least bit afraid of confronting the vicious crimes against women and their bodies while naming their perpetrators. And even in this world of treachery and misogyny, she shows us how to let God settle in. Mm. I mean, excuse me. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I will take all, I will accept all of that. Yes, yes. Um, and I, this has been such a wonderful exercise for me to do that for each book. I'm, I'm going to steal that and give that exercise to my students. I'm going to make them write a blurb for the book after we've read it. But that's a fantastic mm -hmm. exercise, kind of like an abstract, right? For poems. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I get a pass. Yeah, you get an A. Yeah. Good, good, good. I'm a student too. That's so right. You get an A. All right, so this is my first question, literally, that I had on the list for you. Okay. It's been eight years since this book was published, although its <sighs> conversation is really timely right about now, especially with what's happening in Texas yeah. and the laws regarding <laughs> women's bodies. Yeah. In hindsight, 
And I've never asked a poet this question before, but it came mm. for you. Mm. In hindsight, what do you want, need to say about this book that you haven't had the chance to say before? I mean, goodness, that's a good question. I Thank you for giving us space to like just kind of flesh this out for ourselves even, right? I think the thing that I know about this book, you know, my husband calls this my poet's book because he feels like, you know, there's lots of form there. There's all this craft stuff. You and I talked about that informally before the conversation began, but I think of it as my woman's book, right? Like all of my work is woman heavy. My life is woman heavy. Right, so I'm, I'm carrying us kind of every second, but this book started um, in many ways, um, or maybe was kind of being brought to its, to its you know, climax when I was uh, buying a house and moving out into the world on my own as a woman um, and was thinking about things like, well, now I have to get floodlights because if I ever come home in the dark, I don't know who's going to be there to meet me at the side deck, right? And as you are a woman moving through the world, particularly when you're a woman moving through the world on her own, um, all of these ideas about how women have been mistreated and broken and overlooked and forgotten, they had started to like weary me. I had a real abiding fear uh, of being a woman on my own, in my own space, coupled with a real pride and joy, right? Like, look at what we've been able to accomplish. We, all of this, but you know what, your whole self. Um, and that, it just made me, it, it just, it made me, some days it made me angry. Some days it made me sad. Um, mostly it just made me try to find ways to articulate these stories of women whose stories I felt like hadn't been articulated well enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm still just trying to, like that is really, you know, in many ways, my life's work is trying to make sure I'm illuminating the stories of, of folks uh, whose stories I think have been overlooked and underheard. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. You reminded me of something that I ended up sharing in the classroom once that I mm -hmm. never really thought until that particular moment. I don't even remember what exactly we were talking about, but you know how sometimes things just fall out of your mouth and you're like, oh, whoa, wait, where did that come from? Yeah. And I said to this classroom of young people, I said, when a man goes on a date, it's an adventure mm -hmm. or maybe a break from boredom. When a woman, every woman goes on a date, she understands somewhere inside her that it's a risk. Oof. Yes, Lord, yeah. And I've never said that before, but it just felt like it just rose up to the top from out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it made me really think about it. And when I said it at the time, I wasn't even a single woman anymore. And I was like, wow. And it made me think about how many situations that I had been in that were really risky mm. and how I suppressed that idea and that realness of the risk, just trying to have a little taste of joy, you know? So um, that's what that reminds me of. And I always think about how when people say all the time that women talk about everything, we're so expressive, but there's a whole lot that we don't say. And I yeah. think that's one of the things that you do with this book. So I wanted us to, I picked a poem from each section. Oh, okay. And the first section, I don't know whether to talk about where the poem came from first or to have you read the poem, but I think it's just a lot. I think what I would like for you to do, if you would read from The Body Speaks, if you would read sections four, and seven on pages 16 and 18. Let's start there. And then we'll talk about oh, yeah. where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Who sent us forward or back? Should we hail Yahweh or Allah? 
or Buddha or Vishnu or Shaitan or Olarun or Zeus or Balal or Ra or Melektas or Jesus or Muhammad or Abraham or Adam as he is all we know of divinity. And seven, the next time we are sent to this earth, we want no part of this body. The next time we want to live without consequence, with favor among men. The next time we are here, if we must be here, we want to remember nothing. And so can I tell you a little bit about that poem? Absolutely, please. And so um, this book starts with a long poem um, called The Body Speaks. It's in 12 sections and some of those sections are broken into sections as you've heard. Um, and it, it comes from, uh, I was reading, I, I do Bible reading daily and I was doing weekly Bible reading, uh, reading from one book at a time. And I got to Judges um, chapter 19 and there's this story about, you know, kind of like the Sodom and Gomorrah tale, but uh, the, some angels come uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, and so people are kind of shut down. But in this tale, a, a man takes his, his wife. Um, they're on a trip. They get caught up and have to stay overnight at some strangers' houses. The men of the town surround the house, and they say, listen, just give her, just give her your wife. Give her the concubine and, uh, you know, let them have their way with her. So they gang rape this woman, and she is left on the doorstep. Um, dead in the morning. And when her husband finds her, he's so angry at, the, at, at what has transpired that he cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her out into the tribes of Israel. And when I read that, I thought, what the heck? Like, I have never seen this before in all these years. I had to read it again. It's like, how did I, how did I miss this? And in the whole book, in this whole long account, she is never named. Um, and so there's all these theories from biblical scholars, but I didn't really care about none of them theories. What I cared about was this woman who started haunting me. Uh, I started dreaming about her. Um, I mean, I would wake up in, in a cold sweat. And so the first draft of this very long, what ends up being a 20 page poem, I actually wrote in 24 hours in like a fever dream. Um, and then lots and, and lots of revisions later it came to be. And so the section that I was just reading from, you know, I imagined all these, you know, it's in 12 sections because her body was cut up into 12 pieces. And I, I thought I was speaking to that at, at one point. And the section I read is really about uh, Dua Khalil Aswad, who was, uh, who was murdered at, at 17. She was stoned and, and her uh, murder was taped with cell phones. It was kind of one of those first incidents of, of women kind of being tortured at the hands of, of men in, in the technological age. And, and I wondered, you know, what if reincarnation were true? And what if this woman from Judges was reincarnated and came back as Dua Khalil Aswad? How angry would she be uh, that her body had to be taken apart again at the hands of men? And that's how we get to that kind of last little piece that you asked um, me to read. You know, if we must be here, we wanna remember nothing. I was so taken by that poem that I had to go back and research. I wanted to read the whole chapter. I was like, wait a minute, am I missing something? What's going on? Yeah. Um, and those were my thoughts exactly. First of mm -hmm. all, this woman has no name. Yeah. Secondly, regardless as to how, it, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Right. This elder man, addresses this mob around the house by just giving them one of the women in the house. Like, no, mm -hmm. don't bother the man that has come to visit me. Yeah. Just take his wife, just satisfy yourself with that. That was enough to stop me dead in my tracks. Right. 
And then she's left dead. And then you have to mutilate the body. And then I, re- because I read the whole chapter about the dispersing and it reminded me, this, yeah, it reminded me just a little bit of the story of Osiris, but this was on a whole nother. Yeah. On a different level, this dismembering, right? This, you know, because I asked myself, I was like, wait a minute, is this about you? this man and his status and his power yeah. Yeah. and how dare you offend. I was like, is anybody thinking about what happened to this woman and her yeah. body? And you said it so articulately, you kill her twice when you dismember the body. Yeah. And then I was reading about how it was cut up into 12 parts, according to her bones. I was like, how are you going to cut it up? And tw- what, and I was trying to imagine yeah what that would be like. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about how your haunting made sense because we see it everywhere in in the media. There's always another woman that's coming up missing, right? And then there's that whole other conversation about people of color in general who come up missing, right? Um, We are actually dealing with that right now on the campus where I teach, there's a young mm. woman who is missing and it's been over a week. Um, and I just, I wasn't ready for that. I, I That was the last thing yeah. that I thought would open this book. And the thing that I was thinking as a writer was, okay, so how are you gonna open up a book like that? Yeah. And really expect people are gonna get through the rest of it, right? right. But there's right. something that you do that does propel us to move through the rest of the book so beautifully, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that whole question about how we react to the world because we are in this body mm-hmm. and it's not ours or our body's fault. Yeah. And I have to tell you, and, and I'm going to be very honest about this, and I pray to God that it does not offend um, the grandfathers in my ancestry who were ministers, but mm-hmm. I have often thought about how so much of what is considered a holy book was written for the advantages of men, for the profit, for the the glory of men. And when you said, when you first started talking and you said, wait a minute, how come I never thought about this? My first thought was because all of the men who ever taught you were, all of the people who ever taught you were men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was my first thought. Like, why would you think of it? Why would I have ever thought of it? Yeah. And I think you have to get to a certain place in your own spiritual and oh, absolutely. maturity before yeah. those things start coming to you, you mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. and be able to say them with love and power, not just anger. Yeah. And to really, I mean, and to, and to dig, like to think beyond it just being, you know, often the scriptures are, are taught as, you know, just stories, right. And in, in my life, they don't function that way. Um, and, you know, it, it, quite frankly, I, I'm not really bothered by who wrote the Bible. I think I think it's an inspired book. I am very bothered by how, by how people have used it <laughs> through the ages. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, certainly, um, you know, as it comes to, you know, in many ways, I, I say this is my woman book, but my, a womanist text in many ways. Right. So it's a layering of things, you know, in that same um, poem in another section, it starts with a, a quote from Alice Walker in Search of Our Mother's Gardens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think really that is kind of the tradition of Black women artists to wrestle as much as we can, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with what's been handed to us and to not just leave it at that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why they say we're angry. They can say I mean, what they want. Would- <laughs> right. They can say what they want. I'm going to I'm going to tell the truth, though. Right. Yeah. Right. That's why I said yeah. that's right. That's I'm it. a flesh. Right. I'm a flesh it out. I'm going to tell mm-hmm. the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because it makes me think there's so many questions around this chapter and around this poem mm. because it makes you wonder what kind of world was this where it was totally OK? Yeah. Yeah. For and men it, to insist upon having a woman and gang rape her. And then you go back home. Or what kind of world is your this? Woman, yeah. Your wife, 
your concubines, your daughters, your mama, right? If your mama lives in the compound and yeah. it's totally okay, what kind of world is that? Yeah. What kind of world is it where a man can feel like it's okay? Let, you know, I'm not going to give you a cup of sugar or, you know, some of my cattle. I'm going to give you a woman. That says a whole lot. Yeah. And that doesn't just disappear after a hundred years. It just replicates itself in a new form. That's what I'm talking about. You know, I, and, and we won't stray too far off the path here, but it's interesting that we're having this conversation at the same time my husband and I were having a conversation this morning um, that somehow turned its way to Me Too and like this R. Kelly trial. And, you know, even to say some of these perpetrators' names seems insane, but really our whole uh, conversation turned to, my God, how long are we, like all of us, gonna be complicit in the way that people treat girls, right? Children and women, but in, in particular, you know, the way we treat the most vulnerable of us. Um, and so that the book is going back to those questions because even beyond the body speaks, you know, the, the titular poem, What We Ask of Flesh, isn't about a, a, a person, you know, woman who's been mistreated sexually. It, it's about a girl who's been hurt. And we're all just trying to figure out how to bring her back into the world in a way that we can still keep some of her innocence, even though so much of it is, has been taken. So, I mean, I was just thinking about pain on the spectrum and in particular, how we have to build women back up and through and all the way over, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you said we're not gonna stray too far off the path, but I have to mention this. Mm -hmm. um, I just watched about a week or so ago, I just watched Black Widow. Mm. the um, Marvel films. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've only seen half of it. My husband is going to be appalled that I said I've only seen half of it. You need to see all of it. <sighs> okay. There's a, it, it, it's hard, but... Yeah, me and, the, me and the violence. The villain makes... The yeah. villain makes a statement that he confesses mm. that the way that he became so powerful is that he took the thing, he says, I took the thing, and I, it's not an exact quote, but it was pretty much, I took the thing that the world thought was least valuable and didn't want, little girls. Ooh. And I trained them to be powerful. So he makes them into these soldiers yeah. and controls their minds and disperses yeah. them throughout the world so mm. that he can take over the world. But that statement right there, I was like, oh, hmm they took that metaphor and just really went with it. So it's, yeah. it's another reflection of that thing of what is most valuable. <laughs> and the fact that there are still cultures in the world where, you know, if you're pregnant with a girl child, it's not the same celebration. I even know of a situation like that, that happened here just a few years ago where mm -hmm. a young woman was just very upset because her boyfriend would, felt like he was cursed mm -hmm. because their first child was a girl. You know, so like I said, those things don't just disappear after yeah. hundreds or thousands of years. We still have to clean out the cobwebs and find the traces that are left. And I think that's what you do beautifully in this piece. You. So you open with this tragedy in the Bible and then shift to yourself. Yeah. Right? So I want us to move to the second section and I would love for you to share with us things I carry coming into the world on page 25. Things I carried coming into the world. The weight of my parents, the dawn of them, my grandmother's lackluster life, the guilt of my grandfather's mistress after he'd been scalded with hot water, tender flesh boiling on his back. My color, the umber slick of it, deepening over two weeks time. An aunt worrisome, it would never stop. The heart of a boy whose name was forgotten before it was given, who passed me a note in fourth grade that I spat upon and shot back in scribbled torn pieces. Obligation, the bane of memory, the cleft a loss in 1967 creates when a mother of mine 
two mothers removed, is left broken on the sidewalk after a drunk white man jumps the curb in the colored neighborhood. The sorrow of the familiar voice that has to tell me this. My father's falsetto before nicotine had its way with his song. Jesus and all his demands, soft hands, the sight of a woman at my first funeral, called away to God, erupted, brought back in a mega church, the bend of a slow, steady hump overpowering an uncle's back, my godson's vermilion face, the uncertainty of him, the walk I took with his mother past the clinic through the divide, a fistful of wanting, foreign bodies wandering through my own, a blow to the insides when distance walks in, the braid of death streaked and ribboned against my family's back, its greedy interruption, its persistence, the unwanted strands of the thick laced thing. Yeah, that, that poem, um, Things I Carried Coming Into the World, that was actually an exercise that Cyrus Cassells used to give folks at Cave Con. He would say, this is, this is what you have to write tonight. What did you carry when you were coming into the world? What was already on your back when you were born? And I thought, my God, like, that's so much to think about. But then I just started thinking through history, right? Those stories that, that never go away, the sorrow, the grief, um, when you're a wonderful person, when you're a terrible person, so many of those things are already, you know, in the making by the time you're in the making. And um, so it's just kind of a litany of those things. Okay. I, you know, the first question that I'm burning to ask you, please, I swear, is why did you mess up that little boy? Oh, I, it's why terrible. Well, you, listen. What happened? What you know? And and I was like, wait a minute. I don't know Ramika really well, but she just doesn't. I don't. Me. I, I never. Know. I never. And listen, this is important. I'm so glad you asked me this. No one has ever asked me this about the book. First of all, I thought it was really important for me to put my own dirt in the poem because I started out, you know, with other people's dirt real good. You know, my grandfather's mistress, you know, like I started in there real early telling other people's business. So I was like, it's really important for you to put your own dirt. And I mean, still to this day, I feel like this is one of the worst things I ever did. <laughs> right. He was just, you know, you just had him worrisome children. He was a terribly worrisome and mean little boy. But then instead of killing him with kindness, which I know is the right way to be, I decided to be a mean little girl back. And I bet that has plagued me so much longer than it has plagued that boy. <laughs> but You know what I mean? But it was important to say, oh my goodness. And where did you learn ugliness? Like that was something that I was thinking about too. Um, and then, and how do you deal with it when you're confronted with it? You know, who does that make you? So th those kinds of things, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna forgive myself because we were in the fourth grade, <laughs> we were children, but still I think, oh my God, like teach your children to be better. And my, my for sure, my folks taught me to be better than that, no matter what you're faced with, but I'm sorry, little boy, that I don't remember your name. Sorry. Mm. And you don't remember his name. I actually do. I just don't ever say it. Okay. No, we're not going <laughs> to do that. We're not going to do that. So that was the other thing that I was thinking when I was reading this poem, I was like, you know how, you know how Black folks are about you putting their dirty laundry out there, right? Whew. And even though this is a social media age, there's still that old school tenant of, now looky here, you bet not, you know, that type of thing. So when I read this piece, I was thinking, oh, she hung it all out. She hung it all out there, right? Yeah. And I think the thing that softens that blow is the very end of the mm. poem, mm. where you talk about how there's an overlay before all of us come into the world, yeah. all of us, right? And we all wrestle with that in one way or another. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, how did you, 
how did you find the comfort to put those family stories out there? Or have you found, have you ever been comfortable with it? Or why did you feel like that was necessary? I had, okay, so there's a few things. You know, I tell this story often, but it really, it really is true. So in my first book, there's a poem called Fish Fry, but it used to be called Why I Wasn't Invited to the Last Fish Fry. Oh. And what that means is, you know, early on, folks were like, oh, no, like you, you put in business in the street, like this is ridiculous. Stop telling these stories. Like they were, you know, upset. So I had to learn how to tiptoe into it. And what I've done in my personal life is before I publish a book now, I kind of send people manuscripts and say, hey, here's, I, I love you. And also look at page 16. I just want you to know what's happening. And if they have an issue, but nobody, you know, my, my go-to is Miss Lucille, Lucille Clifton. Uh, did I lie? Was just what she used to ask her family, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then what can you say? Um, but by the second book, you know, it takes me a long time to write books. This was seven, eight years later than the first one. It, it was a strange 180. People would be, you know, we'd be out eating somewhere and people would say, hey, Ramika, come over here and bring your little notebook because you got to get this down. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if it's people's mortality getting to them. Uh, if we are getting to an age where people have become less fearful because we're less fearful, you know what I mean? Watching my children, I'm, I'm a lot less fearful because my God, you know, they have a lot more freedom than we do. So I think my aunt's watching me, maybe that's a different, you know, elicits them, a, 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 certainly a different kind of freedom. You know, maybe it allows them that. Um, and also, I just think at a certain point, people are like, look, let's just tell it. What's going to happen? Let's just tell it. So uh, then we don't have to hide from it in the dark, you know? Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. I have a theory about that because mm. I come from a family where a whole lot of things were never, ever spoken about. Yeah. Right. And I think when you come from a people that carries that braid, that overlay, that pain, I think many of our older generations thought it best that, OK, we just need to keep this away from them. We need to protect them from this. And I think that they had really good intentions around it. But yeah. when we saw that stuff was still festering and still going on, I think many of them were actually really puzzled. And I think what happens is, whether they like it or not, or, or are comfortable or not, I think they get to a point where, if they're alive and they see that release, where they see it's like, um, you know, like a nasty wound in the skin. Mm. You can't keep a Band-Aid on it forever. Yeah. You have to take that bandage off. And like old folks used to say, baby, when you go to bed, let it get some air. Air it out. Right. Come on. So that's what you're doing. And I think the difference is when you, the person who is doing the airing, if you're doing it with an intention of love, I think whether they like it or not at first, I think after a while they get it. It's different than a reporter from Time Magazine. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? But when you do that with love, I think eventually that ripples out. And I yeah. think that's the reason why you're now invited over to the table <laughs> with the Nova, because right. they know Ramika's going to know how to handle this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I also think that that's honorary. I think that's an honorary title. Oh, indeed. And you too. Oh, well, that I mean, it's a real gift. Um, and a lot of that comes back to how you live too, right? Like these aren't just stories. Like these are people that I know and love deep, but also, you know, when I, when I need to be called on to take care of somebody, I do that too. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is, again, there's a different kind of trust with people who are, you know, trying to display your pain or people who are trying to dispel the pain of others by sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, to what you said at the beginning about telling the stories of many who feel like they are so forgotten. Yes. You know, I also thought it was really striking that the opening of the book, the biblical, there's a broken woman. And in this poem, in terms of what you carried into the world, you carried a broken woman yeah. into the world as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So I want to jump to, I want to jump to the third section. Okay. Okay. And this right here is just my jewel. It's, I know it's yours, but it's my jewel. Okay. Something divine let go <laughs> on page 47. I just need you to read it first, and then we'll just go from there. 
All right, we'll, we'll see if I can there. see if I can make it through it today. Something divine let go. It starts with two epigraphs. Even the poor know that richness, the fragrance of the lemon trees, Eugenio Montal. And then another, we opened two halves of a miracle. Pablo Neruda, Ode to the Lemon. Free groves spread out over miles of dirt road. And my grandmother, astonished at the sight of the vast orchard with lemons large enough to eclipse her palm, led us in among the fruit, through shadows, past bouquets of leaves and blossoms, until day yielded to evening and the limbs she bent were bare. Carrying citrus home, we sliced the bright bodies, added pulp and rind to sugar, water, black dime store tea. By sunset, we welcomed grace, hands sifting creation, small gifts filling our space. When she died, memory mounted the table, incense filled the house. Folks spoke of bread pudding and scratch biscuits, then of how home was bittersweet. The mistress creeping back to the back door after granddaddy was laid to rest. Weary Sundays when dirt or blood marred the thin linens she pressed. One knew of our matriarch offering limits after salvaging a basket full, a bit tender, but not waste, aged and softened, but still good. A store owner let her take all she wanted in his hurry to make way for new. And my grandmother comforted the downtrodden, a woman who must have resembled herself sitting near the window, the shut-in aged and ailing, watching for what wouldn't soon come. She soothed her bearing fruit, said it didn't take much to find a reason to live, told her just sit on the porch in daylight, let the sun worry and spread the slices thin, turn the alms over in her hands, savoring them, let God settle in. Yeah, that poem. Uh, the book actually opens with an epigraph from my grandmother, who that poem is about. It's for Mary E. Knight, who always taught us the truth is the light. My grandmother used to say that all the time when we was talking about, well, you know, I don't know if I should do I, The truth is the light. Now you go ahead and you either going to do it or you ain't, right? So she would tell us all the time, like stick to that. And was, a, you know, and was like deeply lived that herself as well. Um, and so I felt really comfortable in my skin telling the poems of, you know, the, the stories and the poems of this book, because I knew if I said, did I lie? She would say, oh, no, what well, the truth is it like? Go ahead, you tell it then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good, bad and ugly. But her her main concern, you know, other other than Jehovah, she was a super, you know, um, biblical woman and, and pretty religious to boot. But she was a she was a care giver. So when a woman told us that story, one night after Bible study, you know, it's condensed there. We weren't really sitting around her table after the funeral. Uh, the mistress story did come up. Then. <laughs> but years and years after she had passed, someone told us that story about her bringing her all those lemons, how she'd salvaged all those lemons. And it reminded me of the time we were living in Phoenix and there are all these citrus tree orchards and she had never seen any like that and the lemons are they're about the size of footballs much bigger than anything we see kind of on the east coast where I am now and she was just fascinated like she just couldn't get enough and it reminded me that she you know was always thinking about what can I do with this that can be in service to others like what joy can I find here and then pass that joy on um and so when she left, it really did feel like, you know, something divine was let go. So, uh, you know, I, I wrote my way through it as, as we do, as we are wont to do. 
So she never got to hear the poem. No, no, that poem was uh, written, um, written and, and the book was published well after she passed. Um, so she never got to hear the poem. You know, I believe in resurrection, so she'll hear it someday. But um, uh, many, many poems, you know, she'll be with me in every manifestation for as long as I live. So there's plenty of stuff she won't get to hear, but um, for sure, she knew, she knew all the things that I was carrying with me. She knew I was a carrier and a saver. Um, she came to me with lots and lots of things. I'm writing a, a, a work in progress now. Um, you know, it could be a novel, but it, it, it's, it's got a, a, a protagonist named Silver, who was a boy that she really loved when she was young. So those things will come back as many times as possible. You know, she's, she's in my head and all over my hand, so I, I'll carry her. Do you think she knew that you were working on a poem for her? Or do you think she ever dreamed she would come up in a poem? Yeah, I mean, I wrote, I wrote, and interestingly enough, you know, I've been writing poems since I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. I won my first little uh, poetry contest in the fifth grade. It was, you know, about being a, a Nubian princess, tall, dark, and strong. I always been pro black. Okay. You know what it is, right? Uh, I always been uh, rooting for everybody black, and so <laughs> I, um, one of the very early poems that I found in my mom's uh, papers that she had from my grandmother. Uh, was a poem that I wrote for her. Her full name was Mary Etta. Etta was her middle name. Um, and I wrote it for her probably in the, I don't know, maybe sixth, seventh grade, like when I was very young. And she was saving all these little things. She knew I was a writer. Um, you know, the first book came out just as she was passing. Conversion came out. Um, it came out uh, really, um, oddly enough, uh, probably in the same month that she passed away. So she had, she had, you know, she knew that I was writing this book and she knew there were some poems in there about her. Um, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't the type of person that was like, well, uh, you know, read me a poem. She was like, listen, go get, uh, go get that flower so I can finish these biscuits. <laughs> so we, you know, we had a very different uh, relationship. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't deeply invested in reading unless it was Bible reading. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, she she was outside of that in many ways, but knew how much we admired her. Like she knew she was the matriarch. She didn't think she was special, but we sure did. Um, and because like those ordinary people that kind of kept the families together, those are the kind of people that I always wanted to illuminate. So she knew that was that was my work in the world. Mm. Mm. I think it's interesting. It was really interesting to me how her bouquet was lemons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We usually think of lemons as being sour and bitter sweet, right? Right. And yeah. the last thing we want to be bothered with. Yeah. And we are not able to see their beauty. It was like your grandmother was able to see the beauty in the lemon. Mm -hmm. And then she saw how to take that beauty and serve other people. And I, okay, I'm going to go there. Oh, I think it's up? also interesting that she saw the beauty in keeping your grandfather and keeping it that relationship. Ain't it right? interesting? Because that could have been a lemon. You know what I'm saying? That she didn't For really sure. But, you know, she found a way to find, evidently, still mm -hmm. find the beauty that was even in that. Mm -hmm. You know, even with the creeping out the back door, which, again, is something that we don't talk about in terms yeah. of how very real it is. Yeah. You know? Um, that piece just got to me. So here's my question for you on that one. Okay. Gotta find it. In a world that is hell bent and hell bound, where most of us are so removed, removed from nature and the natural, mm. how do we let God settle in? Oh, Jesus. Ooh. You know, for me, I will say this, we've been ruminating on this a lot. Uh, in my house and just uh, particularly, uh, what a good question, because of COVID probably, right? And because we've had to spend so much time being insular. And then when we are allowed to do things, it's like, well, we need to be outside, like in a, in a space. So we've been ruminating so much on meditating on creation, <laughs> right? Like thinking about what is in the world and whatever higher power, you know, you might think, you know, is responsible um, you know, for that, you know, even if it's the universe, right, um, you know, miraculously creating all these very different things. Um, you know, I, I was taking my kids, to, my kid to school, we got another um, 
a baby that's a, a family baby that we pick up and go at the same time. And I said, look at how many different kinds of trees we can see just sitting at this light. And by the time we finished counted, I, I had counted something like eight or nine different species of trees just standing still that we could see kind of towering over us, some flowering, some uh, bright green, some hunter green, some Japanese maples with the red leaves. Some, I mean, it's really miraculous how much variety there is when there could have been so little. Like we don't need all eight of those trees, <laughs> different types of trees to survive. Even if they make oxygen, we could just have one kind of tree that does that, right? And so, you know, when I'm in this book in particular, there's that poem and then there's another poem um, called All the Wild Swarm that is kind of, uh, you know, we're taking a, a funeral walk, but I'm noticing all of these, this horde of bees that's around. Um, and it just reminds me, there is so much beauty, um, some that we fear, some that we overlook, like the lemons some that we would imagine is useless. Um, and that meditating on those things makes me think about how we think about people. You know, that poem is about an older woman salvaging something older. You know, she was 84 when she passed. Most of her friends were of the same age. They were in many ways forgotten about by other folks. You know, it is something to be on your own and to be in your 80s. Um, and, and what I'm sure you have to wrestle with, you know, looking out that, that window for what won't soon come, right? Much of life has passed you by. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing for so many of the women in the book just at large, just overlooked, you know, it goes back to that Black Widow thing, the thing that, you know, people just underappreciate, don't see, don't care about. Um, and so me meditating on all of this, all of these like minuscule, the minutia of all the things in creation, the beauty that's there. That's how I let God settle in. Like he cared about that tiny little, you know, bud on that tiny little tree. Well, certainly, you know, um, surely somebody saw something in me, right? Um, and surely I'm looking for whatever spark there is and as many um, overlooked folks as I can find, right? Um, and so that's how I do it. I don't know how other people do it. How do you do it? How do you let God settle in? Um, it's probably very similar because I've started walking in the park on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have to say though, you called up Shug. Come on. You called up Shug. Come on. If you're walking through and you see the color purple. No, wait a minute. She said, no, -uh. she said, I think it makes God mad. That's right. When you walk past That's right. the color purple mm -hmm. and act like you don't notice. That's right. That's right. Right? Yeah. Um, taking the time to notice and acknowledge the least of these. Mm. I was having a conversation with my students the other day about stillness, too, mm -hmm. what that means in the world. I think Shug's kind of that admonition uh, about us, uh, we have a responsibility to recognize beauty um, and, and part of cultivating stillness for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that might be in there, too. Mm -hmm. Because some things just won't come through unless you are still. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you want people to walk away with from this book? What is your wish? Um, a little more awareness about um, how difficult it can be to walk through the world as a woman, mm -hmm. um, like really and truly, uh, and how different everyone's journey is, but also how resilient. When I see a woman walking through the world, I, I'm, I mean, I'm just amazed, <laughs> right? I'm just amazed, um, particularly those of us, you know, who have made it beyond a certain age. It just, I, I live in wonder about how they made it here. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope this, this book makes people um, more respectful of how folks made it here, <laughs> right? How they're still surviving. And then if they're thriving, my goodness, that's a whole nother lesson, right? Mm -hmm. um, and gratefulness. Ooh, we should be grateful for what we have and kindness. How do we how do we carry kindness all the time? Let's think about that.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to ask you this, this question. I didn't ask you to read the last piece um, mm -hmm. that mentions those three poets. However, I, when I think about the forward that was written and the comments that were made about that, mm -hmm. and then when I read the poem and I looked at the title several times, How I Crossed Over, my question is, is that poem just about them crossing over, but is it also about your crossing over too? And if so, you crossed in, you crossed from what over into what, if that makes sense. Interesting. That's a good question. Um, the last poem in the book, How I Crossed Over, uh, is written in the voices of three poets who passed in very close succession. Um, Lucille Clifton, the poet I, and the poet Carolyn Rogers, um, and all who were just kind of, when I say instrumental, like to me as a poet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was writing in their voices, but in particular, I was, I was writing through this journey, like how, um, how, do I, how do I make my way from this space without some of these women who have carried me into whatever space I have to make for the women I'll have to carry? That, that was what I was passing through. And that was what I was thinking about the poem before that or very close to that is called Will and Testament where I'm talking about my own kind of wishes for when I'm making my way to the other side. Um, and so, you know, those are elegies of course, but we're often making our way through, you know, some difficult course and rebuilding, reassembling ourselves, coming to life in a different manner. Uh, and I just thought about how many times those women reinvented themselves and then through their work reinvented me and I wanted to carry all of us that way. Okay, okay. Well, you know, when you've been taught how to let God settle in, you don't have to worry about any of that. Come on. You don't have to worry about any of that. So tell us what you're working on these days before we <laughs> wrap up, what you're working on. Oh, is there anything that you want to share with us that you are working on these days? Because you blessed us and graced us talking about an older project of yeah. yours that is obviously still very, very relevant and, and contemporary. Yeah. But is there anything you want to share with us? Um, I think, you know, in the same vein, like all of these threads continue to, to move through my work. So I have a book of prose, my first book of um, prose is a, a being called a memoir, but it's essays, soul culture, uh, black poets, books and questions that grew me up will come out um, next year from Beacon Press. And um, for years, I did interviews with so many of these poets like Lucille Clifton and Sonia Sanchez and Natasha Trethewey and, you know, just poets that I really admired. Um, and I, I wanted to find a way to kind of put those in a place. And what I eventually did was utilize some of the, the work from the interviews and wrote essays about my own journey to the writing life. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of just really wrestling with, you know, what does that mean to be in this space? Um, among Black poets who are kind of carrying you. And so that's that's what I'm doing now. I'm in the middle of copy edits. Um, there's, you know, other stuff that I'm working on too, but that'll be that'll be the next thing you see. So I'm super, super excited, um, you know, that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do another talk or we'll get together again once that book is in the world next August. Okay, that had gone through my mind. I'm glad that you <laughs> I'm just yes. said it. I'm glad that you said it because I'm like, oh, that would be wonderful. I yeah. would love it. Please. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know every all of us are incredibly busy, especially if we do anything at right. any school. Right. It's overload. It's just just absolute overload. The plate is flowing over. So thank you for taking the time to do this, for being wide open with no script, not having any <laughs> idea what I was going to ask you. And I, I, I honest to goodness, I am always amazed at the people who tell me, yes, I always let my spirit guide me of, mm -hmm. you know, who to ask, who do I need to ask next? And a name will pop up. And I'm like, you sure that one right there? Because I don't really know. So, you know, and, and that yeah. person is doing this. That. And so I'm always just like so thrilled and so humble when someone says yes. And when someone trusts the space mm 
Mm-hmm. And um, I hope that this space was a blessing to you oh, in some kind of way. And thank you so much for showing up. I mean, thank you for just inviting us into any space and caring so deeply for our words. Like this is a real gift to us. So, I mean, I just, it's a real gift to me. I won't speak for everybody, but for sure, you know, seeing that book all annotated up and you come up with questions and ready to let me wax poetic about some people I love. I appreciate that more than you know. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a theory that, um, Mm, I'm trying to figure out how the best way to say this. I think that some poetry is its own scripture Mm. or related scripture. And I think that it is part of, oh, and I'm just hearing it for the first time. It is part of an ongoing holy book. Mm. And so I'm just very grateful to have yeah. any connection to that. I hope we are. I, I hope what so much of the work that so many of the traditions we're trying to walk through, you know, I'm, I'm going back to those poets. Those poets were walking in the path of my God. I hope, I hope we're connected in the same holy book in that way. Yeah. Okay, that's a wrap. <laughs> like put the pen in it right there right you know i can think of some other things but sometimes you just need to to pause in that sacred space so thank you again um folks thank you for tuning in and joining us for this episode of breakdown remember that sometimes a poet and a poem just might get you through or take you to the next level or save your life I honestly do believe that I'm a totally different woman because of poetry in my life, so I'm grateful. So we hope that you will enjoy this and join us for the next breakdown.